Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch, licensed acupuncturist and holistic health coach. With me today is someone that I shared an Uber with, actually, in in Detroit as I was out there doing a talk show interview, which will be airing in September. And it's one of those things where the universe just sometimes puts you in the path of the people that you have either something in common with, something to learn from, something, you know, some sort of gift to exchange. And so I found myself on the way to the airport in the back of this Uber uh, with this delightful woman named Kali. And in the front seat was her husband, who is my guest today. And we just hit it off and realized that uh, there's a lot of commonalities in the work that he was doing and the mission that I'm on to help people really live into who we could be on this planet and to transcend our safe social masks and to, to really live in accordance with who we really are. So it turns out that Kali's husband is Dr. Suvrat Bhargave, who is a renowned and respected educator, speaker, and board certified psychiatrist specializing in child and adolescent psychiatry. He is known for his ability to relate across demographics and to relate with empathy and empowerment and education. Dr. Bhargave is a highly sought after lecturer on a broad range of topics pertaining to personal growth, effective parenting, relationship satisfaction, and mental health. He completed his residency and specialty fellowship from Duke University and has continued to practice in hospitals, community health, as well as private practice. He has a new book called A Moment of Insight, Universal Lessons Learned from a Psychiatrist's Couch. And today we're going to have a conversation that spans shame and guilt, worthiness, spirituality, and psychiatry. Dr. Suvrat Bhargave, welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. Uh, thank you so much, Brody. I, I tell you, even as I was listening to you talk about how we met, I could picture that Uber ride again in my head, and I could hear you and Kali in the back seat just going on and on and on what sounded like a delightful conversation. I was trying to keep our driver uh, entertained as well and have a conversation, but I was so curious what was going on with the two of you. So when Kali said to me, this is a fascinating person that we have got to listen to her podcast and keep this connection. It is amazing to me how the universe connects. I mean, literally our paths crossed as it were, and I'm glad it did. Well, and we weren't even supposed to have taken an Uber, right? Like we were <laughs> a little bit of chaos around that trip and, it went, and you guys were pressed for time. So it was, anyway, but as, as it was, it all, it all worked out. And, uh, and it worked out exactly what it was supposed to in a better way than we could have imagined, actually. And we made our flights, all of us did. So it's all good. Exactly. It, it all turned out great. And, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so we get to so we get to chat. We get to dive deep on, on topics that I know a lot of people can relate to, right? That uh, we've been going into more about shame on the show and, and, and how that really holds us back, keeps us stuck in mm-hmm. ways that that are that are not productive and a lot of times the way through shame has to do with being able to talk about it being able to to recognize that we're not alone and that we're human and and so I, I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey and why this is I, I understand that you have a, a deeply personal relationship with with shame as it challenged perhaps your spirituality oh yeah for sure I agree. I mean, you know, when when we talk about shame, what makes it so difficult is it's this internal weight, isn't it? It really sits in our souls and it really holds us back from being creative and being productive and, and being our truest selves. And yet it's hinged on being vulnerable. I mean, you have to at some point identify it and, and if possible, really kind of explore it and talk about it. And, and, and so, so as someone who had his own journey that was laced with shame, 
to be in a profession now where as a psychiatrist, people come to see me when they're at their, you know, some of their lowest points in their lives. And in those moments, the, the theme that kept showing up over and over again is how much people are burdened by shame. And sometimes it's the shame of merely having to come see a psychiatrist. That in itself carries shame for some people. Yeah, there's still some stigma around that in, in our mm-hmm. society for sure. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, ultimately, so much shame, shame around, you know, who I am, what I feel, what, I've, what I think, what I've been through, what my experiences are. So many times that was, that was the first step. And I, I just don't think you can start with a path of understanding who you are or a path of getting out of a situation that you're in or if you're feeling stuck, um, certainly not transformation unless you first bring it on, right? You really got to talk about what it was about your experience so far that's caused you to feel as though you're not good enough or broken in some way or defective. That's a very common theme that I've seen with the people that I get to sit with. But in my own life, uh, yeah, shame came into play very early on in that I think most of us, especially as children, we work so hard to just fit in, right? I mean, none of us really understand that there's a beauty and a, and a strength in being different. Uh, if anything, we, we want to just know that we fit in some way. So there were a lot of things um, in my childhood that made me feel like maybe I don't fit in. Being an anxious child myself, and, and now that I'm in a position to help other anxious children, anxiety in itself is about doubt. It's the disease of doubt. So you're always second guessing, always wondering, you know, am I, am I performing the way I need to? Am I safe where I am? Am I saying the right things? Am I doing the right things? Am I, am I good enough? So that was a, a part of it was that I already sort of had that filter, which I think we're all born with a certain predisposition or a filter. Absolutely. And especially because, especially as kids, we're, we're constantly looking, we are looking for cues that we belong because at one point in human evolution, we might not have survived if we didn't fit in, if we didn't please our social group that, that we're right. a part of. And so there is, I think, this biological piece of of feeling like in order to stay safe, we we have to be approved of by the people around us. And shame is this sort of social emotion where it's not something that that would arise if there wasn't social norms, if there wasn't expectations that we felt like we needed to meet or conditions by which we are okay or acceptable. Yeah, I completely agree. That's a great way of putting it, you know, that sort of biological need to, to be that way. I've often said, you know, if we if there was no reason for us to have need social connectedness, why would we even be here, right? I mean, that this this plane is really about being connected. And yet, how do you feel connected without compromising who you are based on what you think everyone else needs you to be? I think that's that's a real struggle. And for kids, unfortunately, inadvertently, we kind of do send them the message that um, there is a certain way of doing things. There's a right and there's a wrong. And and uh, you certainly want to be in the right. And if you're an anxious type of person anyway, you certainly want to be in the right because you think by doing right that you are then good enough. So we we mix the two. Kids do that all the time. Uh, when I see them in the practice, you know, kids are almost conditioned to think about what they do as a piece of who they are. And those are two entirely different things. Well, and especially I think in her society, I talk a lot about young addiction, right? Where mm-hmm. in, certainly in American culture, right? The idea of doing more, doing it faster, how it looks versus how it feels, the, the, the externals and the, at, at like so much of of our identity is wrapped around how much we get done in a day and, and what, you know, what the work that we're doing as opposed to how we are showing up the quality of our presence. And that is, I I think, part of this sort of outdated, overly masculine paradigm that, that is, you know, certainly in Chinese medicine, we know that health is a, is a balance of yin and yang and Mm -hmm. that being overly young at, at the expense of degrading the body, the intuition, the being aspect of, of our nature it's ultimately things are going to break. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I've heard your podcast ever since our Uber ride. I've heard your podcast now many times and gone back. And, and your philosophy and mine, really, ultimately, we're, we're all talking about the same thing, which is about balance, finding that right balance. Because the fact is, I mean, there is, a again, an, an importance in being connected. There is there's something about having healthy connections with other people that is that is really vital, I think, to our growth. 
And yet you have to have a sense of yourself, a sense of individuality um, that is completely an understanding that you have of yourself that's not anything to do with anyone else. And, and in the book, in a moment of insight, I, I talk about how I, I reached a certain point finally in my life after already having doubts and having other experiences in my childhood where I made all kinds of assumptions about, about what that meant about me. And then it finally came to a head and, and, and to be 20 years old and to, to reach a really low point in my life, I think is exactly what you were saying. At some point, if you're off balance, it's going to show up. It's going to show up. Uh, and, and your and your body can can have it manifest. Your uh, emotional well being will certainly reflect it. Even your productivity and then the things that you're doing in your life. I mean, at some point, every every way in which your soul can can nudge you uh, to to address this, it's going to do it. How do we digest shame? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think a lot of digesting it means you actually have to start getting into it and getting a flavor for where your shame comes from, you know, for, for so many of the people that I see, even though they come in and they might feel shameful about uh, an event in their life. The fact is this was just a series of events in their heads or a series of feelings that they've been feeling for a long time. And we have to go all the way back to, you know, where did this first really begin? So for, so to relate it and through an example, I'll just share my own story of that. Again, as an anxious child, I was al already kind of worrying about, do I fit in and, and questioning and doubting? And then as you get a little bit older, you start having experiences in your life, which you think are, are further proof, right? We're not very good scientists as children. We're, we're, we are emotional beings when we are young ones. And scientists will tell you a, a good experiment means you have a hypothesis and then you just collect evidence. You don't go collecting certain kind of evidence. You don't skew the evidence. And then you see if your hypothesis holds. Well, I think most of us as kids, we start off with a hypothesis, which is perhaps based in fear. And then we selectively notice the things in our lives that we think really solidify that fear. So for me, as, as an anxious child, then when I go to school and I'm trying to figure out where I fit in, you know, as an Indian American, trying to figure out what which, which tribe is mine and, and where I belong, and then finding out that maybe athletics isn't really my thing, but, but boys are supposed to be athletic and that's not my thing. And see, there's another piece of evidence. And then you get bullied, which, you know, unfortunately was something that I experienced in my childhood. A lot of people experience in their childhoods, a lot of the kids that I see, that becomes another piece of evidence. So there's so many things that we think solidify our story until we really start to believe it. And what I share in the book, um, which I'll, I'll tell you honestly, wasn't my initial intent when I started writing the book, but what I share in the book was on top of all of that that made me doubt, I also was being abused in the home by an extended family member, sexually abused. And to me, that was just the biggest piece of evidence that I... I was broken, that I wasn't good enough. Um, so I think to really tackle shame, you have to not only look at the thing that's staring in the face that you believe is the biggest thing you feel shameful about, I think you have to go back and question all of it. You have to really go back and say, could it have been that this story that I've been telling myself my whole life, maybe, maybe that wasn't exactly the full story. Maybe there's a different way of looking at all of that. Maybe there's, there are are pieces of evidence that I left out even um, throughout all of that. Really, really important point, right? That that are the stories that we make up when we're kids that, yes, they bear looking at through a different lens. Uh, but I'm curious how you even formed that story of like, first of all, like, that clearly as adults, we would look at a child being abused and think there's no way that this is the child's fault or mm. that it means anything about the child, like mm -hmm. being, being in any way flawed or unworthy. How did your young brain jump to that conclusion? So, I, you know, again, this was something that had started early in my life. And so I don't remember, to be honest with you, Brody, if I was already an anxious type of kid and then this happened or this happened and I became even more of an anxious kid, you know what I mean? But, mm -hmm. but I, certainly, I certainly was doubting from a very early point in my life. I mean, anxiety or fear or doubt 
had its grip on me for for as long as I can remember. I probably really, now that I think about it, knew the presence of fear even before I could begin to wrap my head around the presence of God. So to have that already, and then to have this experience, whether blame was a part of the shame or not, what I did know is I was keeping a secret. And in keeping a secret from the people that I loved the most, you know, my parents, my, my family, even though the, the act itself was certainly not and has never initiated or the blame or the responsibility of the child, as soon as you become part of the keeper of the secret, you assume some responsibility for it. And so simply in keeping that secret, I felt like I was, I, I was keeping something wow. from my parents. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, that you, you felt complicit. Exactly. And so, so, you know, one of the things that children are taught, understandably so from a very young age by their parents is don't lie. If you lie, you know, that's a bad thing. And again, children will then hear that as a bad thing means you're a bad person. And by keeping a secret, I mean, in essence, I was lying. And so it, that definitely was a, a big part of the shame. Um, it, it had little to nothing to do with who started it. It was just that we were now sharing this thing that was going on, uh, my perpetrator and I were. So that was happening. And then if on top of that, um, I was, let's say again, bullied in school. Well, to me, part of that was something else that I kept from my family. I, I didn't, you know, a lot of kids don't go home and say, hey, I was bullied again today. Uh, in fact, we don't often know about what a child goes through. So now I'm holding on to that as well. So, so some of the, the burden of shame came from the secrecy of it. I get that. I, I, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and then to feel that I, I can almost feel the weight of that physically mm-hmm. in the body, mm-hmm. right? That, that that's necessarily going to be something that is that's heavy to carry around and that's that's bound to to impact you emotionally and mentally for a long mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Tell me about how you were able to to overcome that in your own life and what that took. Sure. So it, it's it's funny because by the time I was in my 20s, I really I had done a lot of work within myself. Um, I was always a kid. And here, here's the flip side of anxiety. So one side of anxiety is doubt and fear. The other part of that anxiety is you're always questioning. And every evolved being, every scholar will tell you that uh, they lived a life of asking a lot of questions and not just accepting things, but always kind of wondering. And so within my head, Brody, I was always, I was always questioning. Uh, in fact, I remember sometimes even saying to myself, looking around at my peers and saying, you know, no other kid in here is probably thinking about all the stuff you're thinking about in your head. Now, as it turns out, they probably, there were several, probably some that were, but I was always questioning. So there came a point when I was, again, in, in my 20s, I was in college. Um, I had been used to, at this point, being my own worst critic. I was used to saying things to myself in my head that I now recognize as really just being abusive. I would, I would really kind of beat myself up over the mistakes I had made or things that weren't right. So on this particular day that I'm about to tell you about, I was in college and I was about to get on the bus to go from one end of the campus to the other end of the campus. And I was having, again, this, this whole barrage of negativity in my head. And as I got on the bus, I was saying something to myself along the lines of, everyone on this bus is thinking that you're looking really, and then I don't remember the word of the day. I don't remember what the negative word of the day was, um, because I would have that sort of conversation all the time with myself. I, I always say, and I said this in the book, it, I remember it was a raining, rainy day. And knowing me, that probably meant a bad hair day and I have fun with my hair. And so for me, it probably was ugly. So I got on the bus and I thought to myself, everyone on this bus is thinking you're looking really ugly, perhaps. But as I got on the bus that day, for the first time, I actually answered myself back, not in an emotional way, but a very calm, objective way. And I said to myself, do you really think? Do you really think everyone on this bus is thinking that you're looking really ugly? And it's hard to describe now, Brody. It was almost such a gentle calmness to that moment 
where I started looking around and I realized that not only were most people probably not thinking that, but I don't even think anyone really even noticed that I got on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so like the part of you that is uh, sort of self-obsessed and, and yes. paranoid and thinking like that, just, just having, just having a, another voice in your head question yes. whether that actually was really happening was enough to dissolve some of that thinking. It did. It, it, at least it challenged it. Right. Yeah. It was like, it was like a, a full stop to the emotional conversation. And it was just a really quiet do you really think, do you really think this could be the case? And, and so to look around and realize that not only were most people not looking at my hair, they didn't even know I was on the bus. I mean, I I wanted to laugh out loud. I was so relieved, but then the problem was I doubt set in again. And I thought, well, I mean, I don't know, maybe they are, maybe there are. So I decided I was going to run my own experiment and uh, I skipped my next class. I sat on the bus for the next hour And I just objectively looked at people getting on and off the bus. And I said to myself, let's see, let's just see. And of course, at the end of that hour, I got off the bus and had come to the conclusion that sure enough, no one really even noticed. And perhaps there were even one or two just with a a nice nod or a smile, maybe even thought something kind of nice for a second. You know what I mean? And, And so I got off the bus and I sat on this bench. And at the same time, I felt immense relief an immense sadness. I felt so empty. Uh, I felt so empty because I realized that if what I was thinking wasn't what people were thinking, well, I had based my whole life on who I needed to be based on what I thought other people were thinking. Right? If if I could if I could be the 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 brother that I needed to be, or the son that I needed to be, or the friend that I needed to be, or the student that I needed to be, as long as I thought other people thought I was doing that well, then I was fine. And now I had no idea what people were thinking. So it was, a, it was the lowest point of my life and it was also the turning point of my life. Uh, it's why I call the book a moment of insight. It was just, just this moment of clarity um, where emotion was set aside and I realized that this way of thinking may not be truthful. Bringing shame out of the shadows and holding space for people to speak it and dissolve it is a big part of what I do with my clients. I love watching people let go of it because it's so often at the root of things like stress or emotional eating or even being willing to sit down and meditate. Shame gets in the way of feeling like we even have the right to take care of ourselves. So when we're willing to go there, we're able to show up in a new, more powerful way. What I do is not therapy, it's coaching, using the self-study tools and the energetic lens of Chinese medicine to help you see yourself and your survival strategies in a way that catalyzes deep self-acceptance. If it's time for you to invest in your own transformation and are thinking about working with me one-on-one, head to brodywelch.com and apply. So Rod, I love the fact that your anxiety that made you question everything was actually part of your healing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I say to kids all the time now and, and adults that I treat who do have anxiety, I know it's hard to imagine right now, but I hope that you will also look back on this and realize that your anxiety was quite the gift, which in the midst of it sounds ridiculous. Um, and yet you're exactly right, Brody. That's it. It was my doubt that also allowed me to doubt my doubt. Um, <laughs> because which, when you, when you do, when you, when you're, when you have the ability to look at the way that your, your whole world view as just an option, <laughs> yes. a whole, it's, it's terrifying because it questions the whole way you've been looking at the world, but it also opens up lots of other ways of thinking and, and that sort of patterning of, of our, our worldview where we're con- constantly kind of pulling things that fit into that worldview as evidence that being able to step outside of that and maybe look in a different direction through a different lens. Uh, yeah. So totally free. I had a moment like that, that, that I'd like to share uh, when um, I was quite the existential angsty teen and at an early age really felt the weight of responsibility for being a good person, whatever that meant. And I was raised to think that, you know, spirituality and religion was like for the weak, you know, like opiate to the masses and all that. Um, and, but I, I had this sense of 
connection with other people on the planet and the planet itself. And I felt like I needed to be doing something each and every day to be helping with the issues that I cared about. Like even as a high school kid, I was doing all this volunteering and all this activism and environmental stuff and homelessness and hunger issues. And feeling like if I didn't, if my actions didn't line up a hundred percent with my values, then I was fraudulent. And therefore no one, how could anyone say that they knew me or loved me? Mm. And so it was, and then, you know, recognizing that at one point, actually psychedelics were involved um, in the, with this particular turning point, um, the mushrooms, that where I realized that even after explaining kind of like that basically like logically negating the existence of love uh, to a good friend, she said to me, you know, I have I, yeah, I, I hear you and all this stuff and I don't understand anything that you're saying, but I do know that I love you. And she gave me a hug and the energy behind that hug just melted away in my whole logical premise on how like I was completely unlovable. And I, and I had to, this crack in my logical worldview of, of basically a form of materialism, not materialism in the form of identifying with stuff, but identifying with action over being. And I realized that actually that like she knew me and loved me, like whatever I thought I quote unquote was or was not demonstrating or making available. And it was so real that I had to let it in. Well, I, I, Tell you what, I'm resisting jumping up and down in my seat right now because <laughs> what is that? high five to you, girl. Because <laughs> what you just described, I mean, that's it. That's the moment of insight. A moment of insight is when you you can't help but see something differently. It, it's where you put emotion aside and you have just this little pause in your perspective, and it challenges a way of thinking or feeling or behaving. And you had one. And, and that just gets me going. I, I, Cause it's from that moment of insight, if you build on it and really work from it, um, that you can find that series of change can lead to transformation. It, you can't flip a switch and be transformed, but you can have that kind of a moment and it can make you say, wait a second, there might be something else here. Uh, that that I haven't quite done. And that's what that was. You just had your moment of insight and I talked about my moment of insight and then it kind of goes goes from there. And, and the other thing I think that was making me do cartwheels in my head as you, as you said it was, uh, you know, questioning the, um, the acting over the being. Because again, I, I had placed all of my worth in my roles, the roles that I was playing, assuming that if I played the roles well, then I, then I am worthy and somewhat good enough. And, and on my really low day, on that day that I just described to you, I fell back on on a conversation that many conversations that I'd had with my grandfather growing up, where he would try to get me to think outside of who I was and what what my what my roles were. So so to say all that, let me say this: my, I grew up in a household with uh, three generations under one roof. So my grandparents lived with us. My parents. And then we had extended family within our home and, and a home uh, a couple of houses away. And my grandfather was a very religious man. So we, we did, we practiced the rituals of Hinduism and, and our religion. We did yoga. We, we talked about, you know, the importance of, of eating right and how that nourishes your, your body and, and all of that. We would have these discussions. But he was also a very spiritual man who asked a lot of questions. I think that was his way of having learned what he learned. And so he was getting us to think as well. So among the questions that he would ask me as I was growing up, he would ask me, who are you? And I talk about in the book how I would actually just get so frustrated as a kid, you know, to have this person coming up and saying, who are you? Part of me thought, oh my gosh, my grandfather's just losing it. And the other part of me <laughs> thought, what does he want? Just tell me what you want me to say and I'll say it. Because he would ask me that and I would say, well, I I'm your grandson. And he would just sort of sit there and he'd ponder it and he'd say, wow, okay, so when I'm gone, who will you be? And then I would say, oh my gosh, I I I'm Suvrat. And he'd say, wow, okay, so if you changed your name, then who would you be? Yeah, and so I, I just didn't know the answer. I didn't know what it was he wanted me to say. And he was trying so hard, I'm sure, and, and to, to impart wisdom to me. But on that really, really low day when I was sitting there and thinking, I need to figure out who I am that isn't based on what other people are thinking, because clearly I don't know what they're thinking. What finally came back to me was his answer to me one day 
when I couldn't give him what he needed. And he took my hand and he put it in his hand and he put it up to my chest and he said, you are God. And I just sort of looked at him like, what are you talking about? And if I'm God, oh my gosh, we are in trouble if that, that's what this is all about. <laughs> but, but what he was really trying to say to me was that there is an essence within you. There is a divinity within you that is pure, that is good, that is worthy, that is divine. And, and he didn't just stop at you are God. He said, God is within you. God is within me. God is within her and him and him and her. And it, to me, at, at, the, at the time that he said it, I thought, okay, I, I mean, I think I get it, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to make of that, but fine. But on the worst day, I had, to, I had to hold on to something, right? I mean, at the end of the day, one of the things that I noticed as a psychiatrist, people ultimately come in to get help because they have even a slither of hope. You have to hold on to something. You have to hold on to the possibility for something good. And my hope was that maybe he was right. Maybe there was something to this. There is something within you that is divinely good, no matter what you've done, or more importantly for me, what had been done to me. And I needed to find out what that was. So I describe in the book how I went about it from that point on, trying to figure out who am I? Who am I? What was he talking about? What, what did he mean that there was an essence within me, which is divine. Well, and, and what a world it would be if we could all actually live from that place, right? Of, yeah. of, to, of being able to really identify with that sort of namaste consciousness, right? Of like yes. being able to, to see from the place of divinity to other people's divinity and and treat us, treat each other from that sort of underlying assumption and belief. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one, one of the things that I say to people all the time is I imagine what it would feel like if you were to wake up every morning and know that you had you didn't have to do anything extra today to be more worthy, or that there was nothing you were going to do today that's going to jeopardize your worth. And you're already there. You're already there. You're already exactly, perfectly, lovingly, wonderfully good and worthy. If if we could really, really accept that, then look, life is life. We, we can deal with life. We can ride the wave and we can deal with the ups and downs. But without that, you, you don't have a place of security. And what, what I give him so much thanks for is that he at least planted a seed that there was something within me that maybe was divine and good. And, and being the scientist that I, I always was, it was a good hypothesis, but I had to go prove it. So I, I would tell your listeners that there is a way not just to kind of hear you and I talking about this and, and taking our word for it, but there are steps to proving it to yourself. All right. Now we have to know what those steps are. <laughs> <laughs> Lay it out for us. What do we need to be doing? <laughs> so here's where the blueprint begins. The blueprint begins with, uh, at some point you have to, if you can just, again, have the hypothesis, there's something within you that is good. Now, where does that where do you even begin with that? Well, either you can accept that there's something in your life that you've ever done that you thought, you know, was, was pretty kind or compassionate or, or something like that. Or uh, the, there's another phrase I use in the book all the time. It's called borrow on faith. Borrow on faith means even if I don't think there's something about me that's good enough, if anyone that I really loved or respected ever gave me a compliment, just borrow on the faith that they, they said it for a reason. Hold on to it. Don't negate it. You know, the thing that anxious people do is we negate compliment all the time. Oh, right, right. Exactly. It just, it doesn't, it gets filtered out because of it, the negativity bias, right? But. We flip it on its butt. I mean, someone will say, you know, you're really nice. And in our minds, we think, oh, he's just saying that to be nice. Or of course, she's going to say that she's my mom or, you oh, know, yeah. what, whatever we, whatever we kind we of attribute it to. Yes, yes, yes. So, so for me, it started with, okay, he said that there was something in me that's good. He based it on the fact that it was some part of a divine. That means spiritually speaking or soulfully speaking, I can't, but I can't even help the fact that there's something in me that's good. What could that be? And so for me, I describe in the book this exercise that came to me, and that was, I said to myself that if I was put on this earth, if there's something about me that was created to be good, then I must have been put here with certain gifts. 
And I couldn't at that point in my life even call them strengths. I thought that it was very egotistical to sit around and think about your strengths, which by the way, it's not. But, but at that point in my life, I just couldn't even call them, but I could call them gifts. I could say that, you know, these were things that when I was put here, God gave me these as well. So my task was you have 10 days and you have to write down your five gifts. And these gifts have to be qualities and traits about you that have nothing to do with anyone else, no matter how old you are in your life. Are you alone? Are you surrounded by people? These are five gifts and qualities that on a good day or a bad day, you just can't deny about yourself. And I don't know where the five number came from. I don't know where the 10 number came from, but I told myself 10 days for five gifts. And I thought I was being generous. I thought 10 days, well, surely I could do that. I've, I've written papers in fewer time than that. I could certainly do this. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. And once I finally did it, I had this list of five gifts sitting in front of me that I'd written down. And I told myself, gosh, if these are my five gifts, then I need to go use them. Uh, I don't want to waste these gifts. I need to make sure that in my life, I have activities and relationships and goals that make the most of these five gifts. And in hindsight now, what I can reflect on is I was giving myself another way of seeing the world and my place in it that wasn't the previous experiment, right? Collecting evidence of what I, what I didn't do good enough and what, I, what proved to me that I wasn't good enough. Now I was going out to try to find opportunity to use these five gifts and it gave me a way to balance. There's that word again that you and I keep talking about. It gave me a way to balance out that, look, I have things I need to work on, but yeah, you know what? Even on a really low day, I can't deny that I have, and then I picked one. So the only one I ever share, the one that I talk about in the book, is I knew the first gift right away. You know, one of the other good things about anxiety, so now there's two good things about anxiety. Here's the other thing. The other good thing about anxiety is those of us with anxiety, we, we have empathy. We're, we're emotional sponges. We pick up on what other people are feeling and we feel it and, and sometimes it fuels our own emotion. So I knew I had empathy. So on a really low day, I would charge myself with uh, going to use empathy and what I found out about myself was even when I wasn't planning on it or thinking about it, I used empathy all the time. So clearly it really was a part of who I am that I had never really allowed myself to sit with, but I couldn't deny it. So, so it started there. It started with trying to figure out another experiment that I could run to kind of prove to myself that there was another hypothesis that might also be true. And then it, it came down to believing it enough that I would start questioning the previous story. That story of not being good enough that I thought I'd proved to death. It was time to now go back and understand where it came from, feel it completely, see it with a different lens, and then release it. Um, so deconstructing the previous story while I was figuring out the second story of my life. And, and part of that came with the permission that I wasn't going to judge why I had come up with the first story in the first place. And what I mean by that is a lot of my experience started in childhood and it's not the fault of a six-year-old or a 10-year-old that he took the experiences of his life with the filter that he has and he interpreted it the best he could. So don't judge yourself for the story that you told yourself, but you know what, at 40, at 30, at 20, at 50, I get to now go back and decide what that story really was meant to, to show me with the experience of my life now. So let me take over. Let me take over. And that's such a compassionate thing to do for that six-year-old and that 10-year-old that you're still, that, that, that you have grown from, but who is still there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with, mm -hmm. And it, I work with a lot of clients who feel like they understand their story, but feel like they still struggle with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there is a practice that that can help people kind of move from that awareness of like, yeah, yeah, I know I'm good enough. And I know that, you know, like just, I, I see where this baggage comes from and blah, blah. It's, you know, that, that like they've been over it and yet they still feel like they're dealing with behaviors like overeating or, you know, something like that, that's connected to this, even though they understand where it comes from. And I'm wondering if you have a particular 
practice or tool that you give your clients when when they are in the process of of really trying to align with the story that that the present day adult version of themselves would like to tell instead of that earlier one. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I love about the conversations you have on this podcast, you guys talk a lot about mindfulness, right? That's such a big part of what you talk about meditation, mindfulness, um, and, and these strategies, which are in essence, a way of showing each and every one of us, that we are something bigger than what we're feeling or thinking in this moment. So in order to challenge the story, you first kind of have to even take it back to, before I can say that the whole story is not not truthful, let me even find out if maybe what I think isn't exactly who I am, even in this moment. So if I'm really worried about tomorrow's deadline, but I take 15 minutes to simply get the chatter to calm down, relax my mind, and get to a space of uh, removing the next obstacle from my head. Clearly, who I am is something other than just the deadline for tomorrow, right? So, So finding ways to prove to yourself that you are something more than what you're thinking, feeling, all of that, it, I think, is a way of challenging the story in, in a step-by-step kind of way. Uh, so for me, you know, with the, the practice of the five gifts, for example, that was even on a really bad day, I couldn't deny that the story that I had told myself wasn't completely the blueprint I had to follow because here was this other way of thinking about things. And, and I think with meditation, same sort of thing. Well, you, you start to believe that you are your fear. But if you have even 15 minutes in a day, five minutes, two minutes in a day where you are not your fear, well, now you got to question all of it. You really do. You got to question all of it. So, so I think it starts with the simplest perhaps practices of showing yourself that you are something more than what you're thinking and feeling in any given moment. Um, I I have a thing that I do where I tell people pick a activity that you do every day. So, For example, I get in the shower every day. And before you get in the shower, really ask yourself, is there anything that needs my attention right now before I get in the shower? And, you know, hopefully the answer is no. And if it isn't, then put that aside and say, then for the next 10 minutes, I'm simply going to be in the shower. And that means I'm not going to think about what needs to be done after I get out. I'm not going to think about what I didn't do, you know, in my day yesterday. I'm simply going to be in the shower. And that that means really feeling the lather on my head, or it means watching that drop go down the glass or feeling the water in the back of my, on my uh, neck, then I'm just going to do that. And by feeling in the moment and, and sensing the things in the moment that I'm experiencing, now when I get out, all those things that I thought were such a huge thing in my life, the deadlines and all, now I can put it in some perspective. So I hope that makes sense. But But I think we have to start with these moments where we can show ourselves that we are something other than our story. And then you can start to pick up on the big things, the big parts of your story. Well, and it sounds like what you're, what you're talking about with the shower example is, is just coming back to presence and coming back to what's real, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, in this moment. And I love that you, you suggest a really embodied way of doing that so that it's not just about thinking about yourself differently or looking through a new lens. It's mm-hmm. just about being where you are and coming, you know, tuning into how it feels to be washing your hair and how it feels, you know, what, what it smells like, what it looks like, what, you know, what, yeah. what it's, what it's like to be there because that the present moment is, is all that exists. Right. And thankfully in this moment right now, we have a lot more, for example, to be grateful for than we do have to be terrified about. In, in most cases, thankfully, right? So, so some people practice what, what you and I are talking about through, through gratitude. And that becomes their way of having a couple of moments. I mean, if you're feeling really anxious, um, stop and, and say to yourself, you know, what are three things I'm grateful for right now in this moment, right now? And look, we have, we have 10 each. <laughs> or at least more, more than that. But if I can even do that, then again, I'm showing myself that I am not my fear. I have to deal with my fear, but I am not my fear. There, there is more to my being able to think about things or switch things in my head so that I, it is not the part of me that I've made it out to be. Absolutely. 
One of the things that I really love about working with the groups that I coach, these women who come together to actually do the habit change thing and noticing what gets in the way tends to be related to these outdated stories of who we think we need to be because everybody in the group gets to reflect back like, well, that's not how I see you, you know, or like that, that's not why I care about you or that, you know, that, that we have these mirrors of, of people who with, with, through, through love and through a shared commitment to growth are able to remind each other like, yeah, you're, you're not this limited sense of self that you're used to thinking of yourself as. And I think that just really like having a, a place where we, that, that other people I think can help reflect us, that mm-hmm. back to us, even if mm-hmm. we have a hard time seeing it for ourselves. Yeah, for sure. You, you were kind enough to mention my wife, Kelly, at the very beginning of our conversation. Well, one of the things I talk about in the book is you know, when I had, was on the other side, I, or at least I thought I was on the other side of figuring out my own experiences of having been abused as a child. So, you know, I had worked on it. I had done a lot of introspection. Had I known about counseling, I would have done counseling. But at that point in my life, I didn't even know about such a thing. Uh, but I had done a lot of questioning. I had started this five gifts experiment. I had come to a place of saying, okay, there is a part of me that is divinely good. And on the other side of all of that, I thought, okay, now now I'm good. Now, now things are fine. And, and I thought that God and I had sort of made this deal that now that I had settled whatever sort of karmic debt needed to be settled, life could move on. And I thought that he was giving me that in the form of this beautiful wife and these great kids and this great career. And I thought, okay, well, good. See, we are, we're good. It's done. We're good. What I talk about in the book is I, I thought to myself that I would now leave this earth having never told anyone about my experience. And yet there came a day where it came out of my mouth before I could even pull it back in, uh, in a conversation, perhaps even an argument, I can't remember, that my wife, Kelly, and I were having. And when it came out of my mouth and I just, well, I started crying and, and, and really broke down. And she, she was incredible. I mean, Brody, the Uber ride isn't enough to tell you all that is my wife, but, but, you know, she was, she was, she was loving and she was gracious and she was compassionate and she was all the things that I never even knew that I needed from someone when I talked about my shame, but, but the thing, and she reflected all that to me, which like you said, made a huge difference. But the thing that I couldn't have imagined that I would also experience in that moment is I felt the sensation which in the book I call, I felt like my soul expanded in a way that I didn't even realize I was being held down. And it was amazing. It was, it was almost like for a second, I saw who I really was. And it wasn't my biggest secret. Who I was wasn't all the things that I thought had made me unworthy. Um, it was just this divine sensation of, of being fully able to be myself. And, and I gave her a lot of that credit because of the reaction that she had and because of her reflection of who she knew me to be. But, but then several, several years later, um, I confronted my perpetrator and his reaction couldn't have been more different. He was the exact antithesis of Kelly. And yet at the end of that, that discussion or confrontation, I, I felt it again. I felt my soul expand again. And so my takeaway from all of that was we have to truly, completely release shame in order to then find out who we really can be. And, and this book has been a way now that it's all out there and I've had to have conversations with my parents and my family and close friends that I never thought again that I needed to have or and I found out each and every time that again I felt this lift and so each time anyone reflected back to me their their love for me their sadness over what had happened the anger that they felt when they first heard you know that someone could have hurt me in any way it, it not only reflected to me what they saw in me in terms of worth, it really validated to me that, gosh, I am so much more than what I've ever gone through or ever felt or ever did. I'm so much more. And I can't wait to find out what that is. Mm, that's beautiful. It's mm. beautiful. Thank you. 
The book is A Moment of Insight, Universal Lessons Learned from a Psychiatrist's Couch. I'd love to get the the quick lowdown about what's in this book and who it's for. So this book was uh, my attempt to really do two things. Number one, honor the many people who have given me the privilege of sitting with them in their lowest times, the patients that I've seen, the, the thousands of patients over 20 plus years who came to me at their, their most vulnerable and allowed for there to be a rich, raw discussion of the things that really mattered. And when you have those sort of discussions and you really get into the deep stuff, you find out that, that what we are ultimately all struggling with are, are really the same kinds of hurdles, what we all hope for are the same kinds of dreams. And, and so this book was really meant to dispense the wisdom that has been collected through and with the help of thousands of people and to put that out there. And, and then the, the other point of the book is to say, no matter what you go through, no matter what your struggles may have been, no matter what you've ever felt or thought, no matter what you've done or was done to you, there is purpose in all and there is worthiness within each of us that is equally and innately fantastic and divine. And so there is that too. So, so the book is really meant for anyone who's trying to figure out what's the bigger picture, how to change the narrative, how to not only tap into hope, but really use it to bring change about in your life um, and, and how to ultimately see that you're never alone. You are never alone. I love that so much. I haven't read the, read the book yet, but I'm excited to do so. <laughs> I thank can't you, wait for you to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing so candidly and honestly and insightfully uh, with me and with everyone listening today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so very, very much, Brody. And I, I would encourage uh, your listeners that when, when and if they give the book a read, reach out to me. Let me know. Let me know what it was about the book that resonated because that, you know, writing a book is, is, is great. It's, it's a, it's a joy and it's an honor and it's almost like your baby's out in the world. But, but to hear anyone say, I got it. I understood it. I, I didn't feel alone. And by the way, you're not alone either. I love that. So please do, please do reach back out to me. And what's the best way for people to do that? So um, I'm on a couple of different uh, sites where you can reach me. The book is available on Amazon. So you could go to Amazon and get it along with everything else that we order uh, straight to our doors. So it can be on Kindle or there's an audible version uh, that I've narrated as well, or the paperback or the hardback. Uh, and then you can reach back out to me on Facebook if you, if you enjoy that. I'm on A Moment of Insight on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, it's Dr. B Moment. Uh, or at my own website, which is a moment of insight.com or drbargave.com. That's B H A R G A V E. Um, but yes, please do. I, I would love to hear from you. The, the, to me, this podcast, these podcasts, these discussions, it's all about connection. And that's what we're looking for. Absolutely. Dr. Suvrat Bargave, thank you again for joining me today on A Healthy Curiosity. Thank you, Brody, for all that you do. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some insights. Thanks for listening today. To check out the show notes, get on my email list or drop me a line, head to brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. I'd love to hear from you. If you learned something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend who you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. Till next time, be good to yourself.